glad to have both Brother and Sister Horlocker here with us today. Uh, I'm not going to do all the introduction. We'll let Amy do that. I asked her last minute, but uh, Rob has done a lot for this university in helping out in many ways. Uh, uh, Brother Wally Kim, those of you that have never met Wally, works with uh, LDS Philanthropies and was wonderful enough to introduce them and have Rob and his wife come and speak to us today. So without uh, anything further from me, we'll turn the time over to Amy and she'll introduce her husband, Rob. Good morning. I am, you have to admit, I am not the public speaker of the family. That would be my husband, and you'll see the difference soon. But I am passionate about my husband. He and I are a BYU Provo success story. We met there, um, seven, well, we met there 20 years ago, and um, we've been married 17 years next month. In fact, this is our little anniversary trip, and um, so I'm excited to get to hear him speak. Um, he was an economics major there. We have four beautiful children, and um, I like to joke um, that when we're out and about with other couples, I like to go to dinner with other couples because when they ask what he does for a living or what he's currently involved in, I learn something new every time. He is a seri he is an entrepreneur at heart, um, and I call him a serial entrepreneur because he likes to do one project after another after another, and he's been very successful at many of those. Um, and he'll probably tell you a few more of his stories as he gives his lecture. But he and I are both passionate about BYU-Hawaii. We were introduced um, by a good friend in our ward uh, to BYU-Hawaii about four years ago and came and visited the campus and really feel the spirit of President McKay's vision here. And we really feel the spirit of you as students here. And we have been thrilled to be involved here for the last four years. And um, just know that, that we love you and we see your potential both spiritually and entrepreneurially and in business, and I'll turn it over to my husband, Rob. Okay. Well, I asked her, what are you going to say? And she said, you'll have to wait and see. It's really pretty, it's uh, unusual for Amy to, to, um, to speak. Uh, she, she's, she's good at it, but she usually defers to me because I just do a lot of it. Um, as she mentioned, we are BYU success stories. What she didn't tell you is we met on the second day of religion class. So Book of Mormon works. So it was actually the, one of the worst classes I took at all of BYU, except for meeting my wife. Uh, two and a half years later, we got married, and we uh, finished up in Provo. From there, we uh, went to the place that I said we had to go to. I told Amy that the world's best place is Arizona. and it was our, She calls it our prenuptial agreement that we would live in Arizona. The hard part is after 17 years, I want to leave, and she's telling me that the prenuptial agreement is still intact. So we, we move around a little bit. We, um, and, uh, we spend time in Utah and spend time in Montana and spend time in Hawaii. And I'm here about every six or eight weeks to visit. Um, it's important that we at least stop for a second and go back to the beginning. When I was uh, young, I didn't know what it meant to be an entrepreneur. But what I did know is that I wanted to do things that were interesting. I have a very short attention span. I would call it adult ADD, but there's really no cure for that. I, in, I love to be involved in, just be involved. I like to be busy and anxiously engaged in as many good causes that I can come up with. At a young age, I thought that's what everyone was like, and so I thought it'd be fi fine to uh, get my friends involved. So we, um, we had a, a series of paper routes that we did together. We recruited people to pa throw papers for us. We um, thought that was a great plan. Then we, uh, I went on and I, I worked at McDonald's, and uh, I'm going to talk about that in my, in my lectures. I started my first company right when I was graduating from high school. So I had a full-time job and another job doing advertising cards, doing small credit cards that would be sold as fundraisers to high schools. When there are opportunities out there, I've been blessed with the ability to kind of see those and a desire to be involved with them. But when you go back, <coughs> you think about what are you going to study in college that's going to prepare you to be an entrepreneur? It's an interesting question. I hope there are some here who want to start their own business, want to be self-employed. Um, it's a difficult question. I didn't know. I studied economics, as Amy said, and really enjoyed it. I also studied finance and figured I could graduate quicker in economics than I could in finance. And Well, <coughs> so dropped out of the finance program, moved into the economics program, and the rest is history. 
So we're going to start off for a second going to something I'm passionate about, and that's economics. We're going to talk about a quick Econ 101 class. Now, that's probably not what you expected today. I don't know who teaches Econ 101 here at BYU-Hawaii, but I think everybody ought to take it. If you want to learn about the decisions you already make, take economics. If you want to learn about the costs and how to make those decisions more effectively, learn about economics. So we're going to talk about two concepts, one called absolute advantage okay, <coughs> by Adam Smith, Okay, and one by a guy named David Ricardo, which is comparative advantage. Both great things. In fact, if I had a whiteboard, I love whiteboards. I don't write well, but I love whiteboards. We could do an interesting, uh, <coughs> interesting example on absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Adam Smith on absolute advantage said that if you are better at making, summarizing wealth of nations, if you are better at making something than somebody else, then you ought to specialize and make that. And by you making what you're highly efficient at doing, you can trade with a person who's efficient at making something else. And by both specializing, you can trade and each have more. So it used to be thought that if, in order for me to make more money, somebody else had to have less. That's not true. We have 200 years to prove to us that I can make more money and someone else can make more money. We can both succeed. Problem with Adam Smith, and I don't want to be critical, is that absolute advantage doesn't exist very many places. Okay, there's really no one who is just so much better at making something than everybody else. But David Ricardo said that there's such thing as comparative advantage, that compared to somebody else, I am more efficient at making something. But we're back to the idea of specialization, that we specialize and focus on what we're really good at. And though we both can produce things, the classic example is uh, Portugal and England. Portugal with wine and cloth, and England with wine and cloth, and, and who should do more? Or we could do uh, a classic 101 thing, island A, island B. Island A doing coconuts, Island B doing TVs, and we could do mathematically and show you how everyone's better off. So I'm not here today to refute 200 years of <coughs> comparative advantage and absolute advantage, but I am here today to advocate that I am a generalist. And I'm going to advocate to you that in today's business world, being a generalist, especially in a, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, is incredibly valuable. So, don't tell your econ professor that Brother Horlocker is, is um, advocating something different than he is. So how do you become a generalist too? Let me get the, this one. What is a generalist? Um, the definition of a generalist. A person whose knowledge, aptitudes, and skills are applied to a field as a whole or to a variety of different fields as opposed to a specialist. Stop for a second. I love specialists. If I'm sick, I want to go see a doctor who specializes in what I'm sick with. If my house is on fire, I want a specialist firefighter. I don't want someone whose hobby is fighting fires. Okay? There are great specialists. There are great experts in what they do. And I'm not suggesting that there's no value in that. But what I am suggesting is that what we sometimes call common sense could also be defined as generalist behavior, as example. When you get in your car and you turn the key and it clicks, you probably try jumping your car first before you call the mechanic. When the toilet is plugged, you grab a plunger prior to calling the plumber. Okay? When you get a sliver or a thorn in your finger, you don't call a surgeon, you try to do it yourself. There is a balance to when you need that surgeon and when tweezers work. In business, that idea of common sense doesn't always translate into what we do. Oftentimes, especially for the small business or for the entrepreneur, we defer to experts. And I'm not advocating against that, but I am advocating that it's important for us to know that the decisions that we make and the responsibility for those decisions still sit with us. So it's important for us to have a, a wide and a vast knowledge, all right, so that you will need attorneys, I promise you. You'll need accountants, engineers, architects, planners, programmers, brokers, human resource specialists. If you're successful in business, you'll probably need all of those people. But today, I'm going to hopefully help you to think about when you need them. Okay? <clears throat> now, is Brother Horlocker suggesting you need to be an expert or have information on being an attorney, an engineer, an architect, accountant, a planner? Programmer, broker, human resource expert? The answer is yes. Now, before you think I've lost my mind, okay, because hopefully you're thinking that at this point, um, 
I believe in specializing and generalizing. Can you do the next one? What does that mean? In order to explain how I can expect you to know something, hey, sorry, to know something about all of those things, let's start with kind of a step back. We're going to talk about heritage for a second. Your heritage. As sons and daughters of a heavenly father, okay, in order to do that, let's talk about his characteristics and apply those to you. Uh, would you go to the next one? <clears throat> Three characteristics of our Heavenly Father. Okay? First one, he is omnipotent. All power is his. He's not going to have more power tomorrow than he has today. He's not going to discover any more power. He didn't have it yesterday. There's no change. All power is his. Second one, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. There is no new truth tomorrow that our Heavenly Father is going to learn. He's not smarter than yesterday. He knows everything. Okay? And this last term is kind of one that I've coined omni-loving. It's very important. He is all-loving. He loves perfectly. He loves you the same today as tomorrow and the next day. He's the perfect and complete um, <coughs> embodiment of love. The one I want to focus on is the, is the idea of omniscience. Our Heavenly Father is the best engineer there ever will be. He knows everything about being an accountant. He knows everything about being a landscaper. He knows everything about soccer. He knows everything about everything. So the real question is, <clears throat> how does that information make it to us? But I'll promise you that as literal sons and daughters of an omniscient Heavenly Father, all of the potential to know all that He knows is already in you. All that He wants you to understand is available for you to know. You are expected to become as He is. You are expected to become as our, as our Savior Jesus Christ is. <clears throat> Often we think that that's all going to happen after this life that you'll get to the idea of knowing everything later, and you will. My challenge for you today is to expand your horizon and understand that you have a responsibility to learn all you can about all you can while you're here in this life. Um, <clears throat> how do you do that? Heavenly Father knows everything, so how do we get it? Well, you're in school to get some of the information. Professors, instructors, and teachers are helping you to learn. Additionally, you've got good books. Uh, we are a big believer in the value of good books um, and not just the ones that are on the iPad. There are great books and there's value in having a book. Um, the experience of others, the wisdom and judgment of others, a great way to learn. Uh, good examples, occasionally bad examples. These are ways to, to learn. But most importantly, the Holy Ghost will help us to learn things because he's a witnesser of truth, all right, as well as he inspires the minds to discovery. Oftentimes we think that <clears throat> the Holy Ghost is just about telling us what is right and what's wrong. But as a witnesser of truth, he can inspire your mind, help you solve problems, and communicate what our Heavenly Father knows to you. Where do we learn about this? The next one. In the 46th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts just for a minute. Okay? And why they're given. <clears throat> we ju I just took a variety of uh, verses. Start at verse 8. Wherefore, beware lest ye are deceived that ye may not be deceived, seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering what they, what, for what they are given. Okay? To some is given one, to some is given another, that all may be profited thereby. Just uh, look at a couple of the gifts in 15 and 16. One of the gifts is to know the differences of administration. How about in the next verse? To know the diversities of operations. Okay? Um, I think there's any value in the word of wisdom in 17 or to have knowledge in 18. But the most important component is at the end, and that is, and all these gifts come from God for the benefit of the children of God. And the kicker at the last one, that unto some it may be given to have all those gifts that there may be a head. For what purpose? In order that every member may be profited thereby. I'm going to tell you the spiritual gifts are available for you to get. However, <clears throat> I, I'm pretty sure that our Heavenly Father is not going to give you the gift of wisdom so you can figure out a clever way to get a Ferrari. Get a Ferrari, okay? All right, nothing wrong with Ferraris. However, the purpose of these gifts, the purpose of the inspiration that you can receive is to benefit everyone. 
your responsibility with success is to uplift those around you. And if that is what your desire is, then you qualify for inspiration. Now, we know these spiritual gifts exist. Now, how do we get them? That's also in the scriptures. In the next slide, we're going to go to the ninth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought, save it was to ask me. It is the last minute before my accounting test. Please, please, please let me know. Okay? It probably doesn't work. Okay? <clears throat> but, before, but behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me if it be right. If you study, if you work, then you qualify for inspiration. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a couple of techniques all right, that help us to access these gifts, that help us to be more effective in business. Okay? And if you're effective in business, you can be effective in all aspects of your life. There is no reason for you to separate how diligent you are in the church, how diligent you are in school, how diligent you are as a father or a mother or as a sister, and how diligent you are at the office. Okay? Diligence and effort translate into all aspects of our lives. All right, let's go on to the next one. <clears throat> First of all, this picture is, it has been up on my wall next to my desk for a long time. Okay? Now, I don't know if you could, it's not a great quality one, but let me show you. <clears throat> if you can't tell, that's a stork, okay? and that's a frog getting ready to be swallowed. Okay? And I can tell you, for the most part, that frog has a lot on his mind. Okay? <laughs> not to mention the beak of the stork. But <clears throat> you'll also notice that the last thing to the very last point, he's blocking the airway of the stork. Never give up. Now, that's kind of a funny one, but let me tell you, it translates into this life. A loving Heavenly Father, remember, an omni-loving Heavenly Father designed a life specifically for you. Not to make you miserable, not to make you unhappy, but to do the exact opposite, to be successful, to be happy to return to be with him. You have the very best life designed specifically for you by a heavenly father who loves you. When things are bleak, for the frog, they're bleak. Okay? Hope is a gift from a heavenly father. You have hope for the future. You have hope for success because you know, thanks to being a member of this church, what the end is. Okay, so let's go through <coughs> three steps that you can do. Three keys to accessing gifts. Okay, uh, we, we just we gonna go back. All right, there you go. <coughs> three of them. First of all, do your present job well. Secondly, there is no substitution for preparation. And the last one, diligence is personal. Okay. <coughs> do your present job well. Now that should not sound like rocket science to anybody. I've been hearing that since I was this tall. And in fact, I resented that statement for much of my youth because I only heard it when we were weeding, we were cleaning things, we were doing chores. Um, my dad said it to me over and over and over again. But, <coughs> and, and now here I am advocating it. Um, give you an example. When I was 14 years old, I got a job at McDonald's. Okay. Um, <coughs> I was actually too young to work at McDonald's, but we didn't bother to tell anybody that, but I started at 14. McDonald's at that point where I grew up was not a glamorous job. It was not one that most people thought they would want to do. But I, not knowing anything, told the owner of the McDonald's, who owned about 10 McDonald's, he's a remarkable guy, I told him at that point, I'm 14 years old, I said, if you can find somebody to do my job better than me, for less money, you better hire them. Well, I walked off like everyone says that. Okay? It, was, it was heady. It was a mistake. But it represented something that was important that dominated what I did at McDonald's. I wanted to learn everything there was to learn about the McDonald's organization. We could have a whole lecture on what you could learn for your own businesses from McDonald's. Because I can tell you, of all the businesses I've studied, okay, I have not studied one that is better at what they do than McDonald's. I learned every aspect I could. In fact, by the time I was 16, I would get up early in the morning to go do the accounting and the cash drops for McDonald's before I went to early morning seminary. There was nothing that I didn't want to know about McDonald's. Um, it was, it's worthwhile to work hard at what you do. 
It was one of the most impactful jobs. If you're always trying to do better at what you do, you're always asking questions, you're always seeking more knowledge, all right, and you're keeping yourself open for inspiration. It doesn't matter what job it is. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. If it's worth applying your time towards, it's worth being the best you can be at it. If that's landscaping, if that's accounting, if that's dancing in the night show, if that's, I don't know what it is. Please, remember your potential. Remember your heritage. Our Heavenly Father wants us to be the very best we can be at whatever we do. Next one. <clears throat> there is no, uh, one more, sorry. There is no substitution for preparation. Let me see if I can help you with this one. Um, <clears throat> the key to being a generalist is to be, for brief instances, very smart. And they can be brief. When Amy and I first got married, we moved, we lived in Provo, okay? We moved below the Y. Now, those of you who've been to Provo understand that that's very close to campus. That was great, you know, made it easy getting back and forth, but it was also a great place to live, we understood, because all the professors all lived there. So there was one apartment complex there, okay? We lived in it, way up at the top of the mountain. Great when it snows, let me tell you, especially on a motorcycle, not wisdom. But <coughs> we survived somehow. So we were in this ward full of all these professors, okay? Young marrieds and, um, and having an experience. The bishop called me in and asked me to be the gospel doctrine teacher. Maybe not the most polite thing I could have said, but I said, are you sure? And are you kidding? There, we had four full-time religion professors in this ward, okay? One of those religion professors actually wrote the textbook for the course of study we were teaching that year. Okay. Now, I don't care how bold you might be, it is quite intimidating to think about teaching to somebody who is profession revolves around that topic. So I asked in the bishop, are you sure? He said, I'm sure. I said, what do I do? He says, I would suggest you study. Well, that goes without saying. Okay. <clears throat> but I learned a dramatic thing. For 40 minutes, if I put in the effort, I prepared for 40 minutes, I qualified for inspiration, and I was an expert. I knew about that topic for 40 minutes more than those professors. All in all, they knew infinitely more than I did. But it taught me something, that the information and the knowledge is out there. It's just a question for us to access it. I worked hard. I read hard. I studied hard. I had more information than we ever talked about, just in case they asked something I didn't know about. But the difference is, when you work hard, prepare well, you can be inspired. And I promise you that those professors did not know more than my Heavenly Father did, or does. Okay? Um, additionally, I've been started lots of different companies. Okay? It's not because I'm an expert in lots of different things. Okay? The la for the last year, I've been studying the, um, the interactions of allergens in the body. Okay? Now, if that sounds exciting to anybody, let me know. It's not really exciting. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to know the, the disease state of allergies because of a company we're starting, a product we have. I needed to know it, okay? Not because I was ever going to be the one selling it. That's interesting. We had a sales force. Not because I was going to be a physician, okay? We have one of those who is an allergist, okay? It's because I needed to know as much as I could, all right? to be as qualified as I could be to steer this thing forward and to set expectations. Um, I would go into meetings. I will have prepared for the, that meeting. Okay? I'll be prepared for the questions of physicians, okay? answering their questions. For that brief glimpse, I was an, ex an expert. In addition, I believe you can't manage what you don't know. You set unrealistic expectations as a manager, as somebody's boss, as someone leader, Okay, if you don't understand what you're asking them to do. <clears throat> that's part of why we talk about allergies and disease states. But it's led me down a lot of roads, all right? Um, we had a commercial landscaping company. Uh, we, got a, we were bidding for a huge job cutting palm fronds. So guess who spent, and I suggested to my employees that we would have a comparative advantage, again, if we did them overnight. Everyone else does them during the day, makes a mess of shopping centers, makes a mess of resorts. Great idea, Rob. Let's do it overnight. 
Um, <clears throat> guess who went up overnight and cut palm, cut palm fronds? That'd be me, okay? Not because anybody at my company wanted me focusing my time on cutting palm fronds, but because if I was gonna set an expectation for those who were going to do it on how many they can get done at night, how long it should take, okay? What safety precautions they needed, I need to know it. I've mowed greens, I was in the golf business. Mowing greens is a great job to do once. I've mowed greens, I've dug, <laughs> I've dug trenches, I've uh, delivered furniture, I've packed boxes, I've drafted documents. I'm challenging you to be a generalist. Understand what you're asking people who work with you to do. They will respect you for it. They will understand that there's nothing that you will ask them to do that you aren't willing to do. And most importantly, you will set expectations that they can meet and exceed. I'm telling you, I am not the best accountant in my company. So we're close, but I understand accountancy. I, we have a, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an attorney, but I understand documentation to some degree and it allows me to be a better manager for them. Next one. <coughs> Diligence is personal. Um, another story. My junior year in high school, uh, where I went to school, that was the year that we worked in English class on composition. So we wrote papers, just wrote papers after paper after paper. And then I actually thought I, thought I was pretty good at it. So I went into this class with this professor, and I turned in my very first paper, and I got it back, and it was a C. I hadn't gotten very many Cs in my um, school experience, but I thought, okay, it's anomalous. So I turned in my next paper two weeks later. I got a C minus. And I was a little offended, more than a little offended. I, I didn't remember ever getting a, any of those grades in, in, in school in, in papers before. So I went up to the, the teacher, and I asked him, about it, and he said, well, I won't talk to you here. Talk, come to me after, after school. So I went back, and I said, what's going on? And this teacher explained to me that I had not written a paper yet that was an A paper for me. Confused. I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't care how your paper compares to the papers in this class. Well, I, I, I like to argue a little. So I said, what about a bell curve? Come on, I understand how this works. Okay, and he said, when you write a paper that is an A paper for Rob, I will give you an A. Until you do that, you won't get one. He challenged me because it really didn't make any difference what, the fe what my fellow students did. It wasn't enough to just do better than the other 30 people in my class. That's not what he expected from me. Now, this was an unusual professor. In fact, I found out later that he had been the director of an international school in Brazil, a magnet school. He wanted to move his family back to the U.S. His expectations were, for me and for everyone else were to do the best I could do. When you think about only competing with your fellow students, other employees, your employers, even your competition, you miss the point. The point is that you're supposed to be the very best you you can be. Being the best you is what our Heavenly Father expects. That's what he's looking for. <coughs> can you go to the next one? In the 90th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, it says, search diligently, pray always, and be believing. What's diligently? Diligently is an interesting, interesting word, okay? Because I can tell you diligently is not the same. Diligently is not the same for Brother Tanner as it is for Brother Horlocker. And it's not the same for any of you. <clears throat> what is study? Remember we went to the ninth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Study it out in your mind. How much study do you need to do to qualify for inspiration? There's two people who know. A loving Heavenly Father and you. Diligence <clears throat> Is a, is a great variable, and it's very personal. If you want to be successful in business, if you want to excel in business, do the very, very best you can. Your best is sufficient to the help of the Lord. Your best is miraculous when you qualify for help. Now, 
another story. When I went to BYU Provo, I didn't want to go to BYU Provo, actually. The only reason, I, this is an aside, so um, I was uh, <coughs> attending uh, Scottsdale Community College and the Arizona State University waiting to go on a mission. I was working full time. I had a, had a, a full time company on the side. I was busy, all right, and going to school full time. My bishop gave me the application for BYU Provo and said, well, you ought to consider going there. And I just kind of blew it off. I was sitting at work one day, and I, read, and I went to the phone number at the bottom. And I dialed up, and I called admissions. And I said, hi, my name is Rob Horlocker. I'm thinking about coming to BYU Provo. Uh, <clears throat> what do I have to do? And the nice lady on the, other side, uh, on the other end of the phone said to me, she said, well, <clears throat> today is the last day of late registration. So you'd need to have your application, your essay, your transcripts, and your um, SAT scores and ecclesiastic endorsement in by start of work tomorrow at 9 a.m. I said, then, but then she said something that was magical to me. She said, but don't bother to apply. You probably won't get in anyway. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? She said, <clears throat> it's winter semester. They don't let very many people in to, to um, Provo, BYU, for winter semester. And most of those spots are filled. So don't waste the application money and time and apply. You probably won't get in anyway. <clears throat> well, I can tell you that that was a great motivator. Okay? I actually wrote my essays at work. Okay? I went that night to see the bishop about the Ecclesiastes endorsement. I faxed things up. We couldn't figure out a way to get a money, so I called a friend of mine up there, and she dropped off, a 25, dropped off 25 bucks for me the next day. Okay? Two weeks later, I received a letter from BYU saying I'd been accepted to Provo. Okay? Now, my parents did not know I had applied. This happened very, very quickly. Okay? And both of my parents graduated from the University of Utah. With multiple degrees. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I walked into the kitchen and I said, I guess I'm going to Provo. And they looked at me like something was going on the side of my head. It was a fantastic experience. Not everything works the way we anticipate it. I went to Provo not knowing what I would study because I had a very specific job in mind. I decided I wanted to be into medicine, but I decided that wasn't really for me. Then I thought about law. That wasn't for me either. Do you know what I enjoyed doing? I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed speaking. In high school, I'd been part of a group that did motivational speaking. We traveled around. I then competed at ASU and, and uh, Scottsdale Community in um, speech, competitive speech, and done very well and, gone and had some national success in that program. I wanted to be a public speaker. There are not a lot of public speaking jobs. In fact, I didn't know how you even got one, but I knew I was going to Provo. So <coughs> we had we'd gotten married. We were just getting to the end of my experience, and I was pursuing um, strategic consulting. You know, I thought that uh, it would be great to work for Bain or McKinsey, and I thought that's where I wanted to be. And then something happened. I got the opportunity to be a public speaker. I got the dream job offer. <clears throat> some research I'd done in econometrics had per perked some interest. And they wanted me to teach statistical analysis and econometric, econometric policies and procedures to business people. Don't forget, I am 23 and didn't know anything. It was the perfect job. I came back to Amy and I said, I've got the perfect job. I canceled my interviews. I didn't want to do any more with, with Bain or McKinsey. I was going to go do this. All right. <clears throat> it's a good thing to be married. It's a great thing to have people to, to, who care about you to talk about. We talked it over extensively. And for some reason, it didn't feel right. And I can tell you, at that time, I fought against that in every way, shape, and form. But I thought, I need to understand it better. So I studied it. I looked at it. I looked at my growth possibilities. I looked at things I could do from there. When can I have my own company instead of working for this company? I did all of that stuff. And at the end, I rejected the job. It was a very, very difficult thing to do, and it got worse. You see, because I had this job, I had <coughs> let all of the windows close on second interviews for strategic consulting jobs. I was going to have to wait till next year. So then I got an interesting opportunity to go back to Arizona and work. <coughs> 
this was a good opportunity. I was working with my father and with his partners. They didn't have any employees, so I, needed to, I couldn't be really be an employee. I had to be a partner. Sounds easy to do, not so easy to do. <clears throat> so I came to my sweetheart, and I said, I've got a great idea. No, we're not going to go work for Bain Capital. We're not going to go work for this <clears throat> group. We're going to take a 50% decrease in pay. We're going to take all of the money out of our savings account, and we're going to Arizona to work. And the most amazing thing is she agreed with me. When, <clears throat> when you're diligent and you struggle and you strive, you still have to remember that Heavenly Father knows best. I will tell you, if it was up to me, I would have taken that job. If it was up to me, I would definitely not have moved back to Arizona to industries that I knew nothing about, all right? Within 30 days of moving to Arizona, I was making a presentation to, uh, there were about 15 <coughs> high, uh, Petro, I don't even know what their title is. They are oil engineers, all with PhDs in California, working for such little companies like Chevron, Bechtel, Halliburton, Department of Energy, okay, as an expert on revitalizing oil wells, okay? Uh, I didn't know anything about oil wells, but I'm telling you, you can learn very quickly if you have to. That's not what I wanted to do, but Heavenly Father had something different in store for me. Would you do the next one? For the natural man is an enemy of God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields the enticements of the Holy Ghost. Will you yield when you've studied hard, when you've given blood, sweat, and tears to do all you can do are you ready to do it at the end? Are you willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to afflict upon him, even as a child doth submit to his father? <clears throat> we are children of a loving Heavenly Father. He designed this life to be perfect for us. Do your present. Go ahead, do the next one. <clears throat> that should be. Oh. All right, so uh, back one. Do your present job well. Be the very best you can do. Seek to not only learn your own job, but those around you. Not because you're trying to make other people feel bad, but because you're trying to be the very best you you can be. Always prepare. If you don't try to anticipate how a meeting should end, you've wasted the meeting. If you don't try to anticipate what goals you want, what you want to occur, how do you know if you succeeded? Prepare mentally. Study. Think, pray. Be diligent. Ask yourself the question, was I diligent enough for me? Did I study hard enough for me? If the answer is yes, our Heavenly Father will answer you. It may not always be the answer you want. Generalists are flexible. In the business world we live in, you have to be flexible. Your, your job will change. It will evolve. Your, expect, your expectations will change. If you're not able to evolve and to modify and use the skills that you have to do a variety of things, you are at a disadvantage. <clears throat> In my company, we hire generalists. My CFO is a great accountant. He wouldn't work for me, except he is a great operational guy. He sits in meetings talking about things that he did not study in school, but he has input for. We have landscapers in a vertically integrated company who sit right next to him. We have people who take care of physical maintenance. They have something to add to the meetings that they would typically not be invited to. Generalists can adapt and are qualified to um, receive inspiration from our Heavenly Father. That's our time. We done? Just almost done? Okay. <clears throat> Let me end with one last point. It doesn't work. <laughs> It's still 10 o'clock, so we're going to talk forever. No. <laughs> Go to the last one for a second. Never give up. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you why this is on my wall, okay? Besides the fact I think it's funny. Um, <clears throat> because when you stop trying, I think you betray to some degree the potential that we have in our, in, in, from our Heavenly Father. When you give up, you deny the sacrifice that was made for you by our Savior. When you decide that you don't have a lot more, then look for help from someplace else. 
I didn't really know how to close, but I'm going to close with a quick testimony. I hope that's appropriate here, of, any, of all places. I testify to you that a Heavenly Father designed this life for you because He loves you, and He wants you to be successful. He wants you to own a Ferrari, I guess. He wants you to be able to provide for your family. He wants you to be able to be successful. He wants you to be successful enough that you can bring people up with you. Those gifts, those techniques, those wonderful inspirations that you can receive through the Holy Ghost are for your, for your good from a Heavenly Father who wants you to be successful. I've been blessed with success in my life. I attribute none of it to me. The only thing I know how to do is to work hard. The only thing I know how to do is to keep trying. And if that means that when things stink, I've got to look at a stork and a frog, then I'm going to keep looking at a stork and a frog because I don't want to tire in doing things that are good. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Questions for me or are we done? Any questions for me? Good. Makes it simple. Okay. Makes it simple. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Man, I want to get that picture there. <laughs> that's, that's great. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Can we switch positions? Okay. Well, we have. <laughs> well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. When you're you may have to repeat them so that it gets on your mic. Better. No problem. Okay. What comes to mind as, as far as your biggest accomplishment? My biggest accomplishment? Let me give you two. One, I have four children who actually like me. Okay? Um, that's a remarkable thing. Uh, the second one, um, I've done a lot of different businesses. We, uh, in Arizona, there's a lot of Indian reservations. And those Indian reservations have always been um, very difficult to do work on. All right? Whole different set of laws, uncharted territory. So <coughs> we... Um, uh, we were able to do to build some large projects. That is not the accomplishment. The accomplishment is under the ground that those projects are on. In one of them, it's 187 acres. There's 250 Native American landowners. Trying to get 250 yeses, not easy. Okay, but it dramatically improved the lives of those people. That's a major accomplishment for me. And now, today, interesting, on that reservation, with the three leases we did, which combined to be about 600 acres, we actually paid rent to more than voted in the last election. So it was a nice thing to be able to see people lifted up, as we were successful, too. We made money, all right, but we had a partnership-type arrangement with them. It was great. Well, let me uh, maybe answer it a couple of ways. First of all, I'm going to give you the best answer, and that is inspiration works. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to say, how do I judge whether an opp opportunity seems to be good as a young person? Is that the question? Um, I see lots of them still today, and I'm not in any way perfect at it. We have a lot of uh, failures in, as well as successes. But inspiration works. But the other thing is I always try to find what we're doing that is different than somebody else has done. I'm really not a big believer in just trying to um, out-hustle the next guy. I believe in hustling. But I think that we do have to have some kind of advantage, all right? something that you know. I'm not a big one for something that you're passionate about because there's a lot of things to be passionate about in life. Okay? Hopefully work is not a downer, okay? but it doesn't have to be hyper-fulfilling either. You know? I can tell you that it's not fun to come to the office every single day. But I look for something that <clears throat> I can do good around me, okay, and has scalability. It doesn't do me a lot of good if I can only do it for me. I don't know if your scalability makes sense. Uh, let me tell you quickly about a project we're doing here. And if Brother Campbell in the back doesn't like it, he's going to throw something at me. We are involved here on a piece of property in Kahuku, okay. Um, right as you cross the bridge, Look left, there's, a, there's the Catholic Church. Behind that, you'll see a farm. It's a fantastic piece of property. 455 acres that, <clears throat> that is in Malakahana. Let me tell you about that project just for a second. I'm passionate about it. Okay? We came here four years ago with the idea that nobody in Laie could find a place to live. Okay? 
we visited where you guys live. It was a little discouraging. Okay? It's difficult here. Okay? There, in Kahuku, I think the last thing we knew, there wasn't a new house in like 21 years. You needed housing here quickly. But you also needed some other things. You needed to have opportunities, economic engines. You needed to have jobs. You needed to have a reason to be here. If you want to live here in the shadow of the temple, there needs to be a reason to stay. All right? There also needs to be a reason to go back to your homes, too. <clears throat> so what we've started is we've started a project up there, which is going to be a give-back type project of the community that involves a uh, sustainable agricultural project to help people here learn how to um, <clears throat> work together to grow food, th food themselves on the small property that you have, all right? To be more effective through fertilization, through crop rotation, and so on. To invite more people up to this side of the island, to increase tourism, to make more jobs, and to make it more interesting here. It's a, it's a fantastic project. It's, it is against all good judgment to, to unveil, especially on YouTube, okay, a, a budding project before it starts, but it's exciting. You have to look around you. I don't expect you to have 455 acres sitting around doing nothing. Okay? I don't expect you to have the money to go acquire it. Okay? But I can tell you, even a year ago, the project I just described to you didn't exist. Where did it come from? It came from inspiration. It came from diligence. And it came from looking around for a need. If you see those things, entrepreneurship flourishes. Okay? Then you work hard. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call myself out. <clears throat> if the project doesn't come about, go track down... Brother Campbell, he's in the back. No, I'm kidding. Track down Brother Horlocker, all right, and, uh, and ask us what happened. But it'll happen, and it'll be a good thing for everybody. <coughs> Anything else?